now. And then what I do is I send it to you on an email and then I post it on a YouTube channel and I will just call it World Philosophies Spring 2022, right? So when if you have to miss a class or if you want to go back over something, it'll all be there. Um, let's see. Anyway, so 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 far in this class, everyone's presented their worldview, and my method of teaching at a very deep level is I am absolutely convinced people agree a lot more than they disagree. It's just that the public realm where people are discussing uh, political issues or any kind of issue has been corrupted by people with agendas. And so then uh, young people like you don't know anything other than a very polarized political community. And you don't listen to people who actually are speaking from the middle because there aren't very many <laughs> or they don't have any public um, platform. Um, so my first question is, how, how many of you like the polarization that's going on in our country right now? Anybody want to raise their hand? <laughs> Do you understand? Here's another question. Do you understand what it means when people say the country's polarized because in some ways you were born into polarization. Everything after 9-11 became polarized. And so I don't even know if you think it's abnormal or if there's anything wrong with it. Do um, you see what I mean? You might think that's normal. What else could politics be but this name calling on each side? Um, so let me just ask you then, do you think the country, do you, you, do you want to have to govern a country in 20 years that is this polarized? How many of you just can't wait to try and govern people when they say such nasty things about each other? How many of you think it, it's gonna be really hard to try and lead if people have such animosity against each other? Okay, and it's not necessary. Really, it's not necessary. So the reason why I like teaching college at this point in history is that when you come to college, this is the moment in your life when you decide who you want to be and what kind of a society you want to create moving forward. I don't know about you, but when you grow up in high school, up until you get to college, you do not have very many choices. You have to live with people that you, you know, whoever you're living with, and you have to be so-and-so's daughter and so-and-so's sister and so-and-so's blah. And you play all these roles and you have to go to this school and you have to take these classes. There really isn't a lot of choice where you really can start making yourself who you are. But when you get onto a campus of a small liberal arts school, all of a sudden you're forced to do it because you are going to meet people with different points of view. You are forced to take leadership positions. You are forced to make your own decisions, even if you didn't want to. So all of a sudden, you're put in a situation where you are forming yourself. Does everybody get that? And that's why I think this class fits with that process, because every single class, I hand you something and I ask you, well, what do you think? And then is that going to be part of your final paper in your worldview and why or why not? So you are constructing 
your worldview and it's not separated from your behavior. Um, so that's, that's where we're going. And that's why I liked college because I, some of you, this is true, especially if you grow up in a small town, everybody knew my dad or my parents. How many of you had that where people were always, oh, I know your dad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's just so annoying because like, I'm not so bad myself, really. It's just that I could not get out from under it. And I loved college, you know, yay, <laughs> this is my chance. And I was pretty deliberate. At least I'm not being a hypocrite by asking you to do this. I did this um, and I'm still doing it. So that's another point is that you shouldn't ever stop. Every experience you have, everything you read, everything that goes on historically, should you should look at it as a way to rethink whatever you thought before. So you're creating your life, but you can't create your life until you're also recreating your thoughts. So that's that's why I think the class is a tool, you know, for character development. But it's not necessarily a tool for it. It's whatever you want it to be. You can use the class to develop your character or you can just get it checked off the check sheet. <laughs> uh, but please don't, what you really don't wanna be thinking mentally is what does she want? What does she want? Because you won't, that's not what I want. I don't want you to try and figure out what I want, right? What I want is for you to think for yourself and you to show me that you're thinking for yourself. And you're being, okay, the five criteria for a liberally minded person. I want you to exhibit these characteristics. This is from the catalog. That you're committed to truth. That you don't just say, oh, it's all relative. Who cares? No, that's, there's no growth in that. That you're intellectually honest that you don't claim to know what you don't know. <laughs> and again, usually in college, students are more capable of that. So I remember thinking as that as people get older, they get more mature, but that is not true. Because once people uh, decide, you know, what their major is, they're going to be a doctor, they're going to be this, all of a sudden, all those criticisms of doctors, well, that's not really fair, right? So you start identifying with something and becoming defensive. And so, and, and once you're spent 10 years of your life dedicated to something, you don't like it if somebody attacks it, right? So in a lot of ways, you can become less mature as you get older, unless you decide that you're willing to re-examine everything you ever thought, right? You're willing to keep an open mind. So intellectual honesty, commitment to truth, fairness to opposing points of view, right? If you write a paper that is really not fair, I'm gonna call you out on it, right? And I don't want you, well, I didn't give her what she wanted. That's, that's not fair. <laughs> I mean, this is part of the lion mission is that you be fair. And so it's not just my opinion or my power trip. It's my responsibility to the institution. Then it's patience with complexity and ambiguity. And I think this, that Americans have a social disease of not wanting to be patient with complexity and ambiguity because the political questions before us are very complex and ambiguous. How should we treat Putin? How should we treat, um, I mean, how do we deal with the situation in Ukraine this week? How are we gonna deal with China? What are we gonna do about climate change? 
what are we going to do about Black Lives Matter and race issues? So these are not easy questions and, and people want something simpler or some people do. And the public sphere goes into, you know, kind of like silver bullet or really immature responses. So if you want a democracy and you want to avoid polarization, you have to be patient with complexity and ambiguity. And I will look for that in your papers. And then tolerance of reasoned dissent. Okay, so you can agree to disagree, but each side has to have good reasons. And that's where I've read a lot of good reasons on every side. Um, and especially I would, I think of um, thinking about the good or what people think of as God. I think of it as a creative activity. And so I don't commit. And um, so the reason I hesitate or I don't say what I think is because first of all, my mind has changed so much since I was your age. Second of all, just think about it. If I had favored, for example, Christianity, and then I have these students whose dad was a Baptist preacher and he sexually abused them and they became Wicca. Well, you know, for me to make a commitment would be to like trigger them back into this abuse. And so why would I do that? So it's not because I haven't, I haven't made my commitments and I haven't thought about it, but I'm not going to bring myself into it. And I also think there are people who have irrational points of view. But as a teacher, I tolerate them because they're young and they can still grow. And the most important thing is that everybody gets to speak. They get their platform. So I'm not going to confront them. But if another student wants to confront them, I say, go for it. You know, it's your world. And it's also, this is your peer. You are going to have to run the world with this person. So if you can try to talk them out of it at age 20, they'll, you're, the, the world would be a lot better off, right? And there are a lot of, there are, some okay so in some sense the world is being run by two different sets of billionaires right it doesn't mean that we have no power to make a difference because we do but some of those billionaires like bill gates want us to get to zero carbon emissions asap and some of them like the Koch brothers are fossil fuel billionaires and they will do everything to re retain a fossil fuel economy. So um, the people in the fossil fuel side are sending out people into college campuses to deliberately try to polarize the campus. And so I will, you know, I do want you to be careful and be aware that your Young, your youth, your naivete is getting or could get exploited. All right. So be careful. Um, don't let yourself get used by grown ups with agendas. And maybe at the end of this class, you'll decide, well, Dr. Beck has her own agenda. And if you want to say that, you know, then you have to say it and you have to give me good reasons and then I will have to think, I'll have to rethink. Um, there were some semesters over the last 25 years when, and there were some students that I, that triggered me and I did overreact and then I apologized. And it's not that I don't make mistakes. I just hope like the, some of the rest of you said that I would self-correct and apologize. Just one time, 
a student just came and trashed Socrates. And this person had looked it up online and found other philosophers that just trashed Socrates. Like that. <laughs> I had just punched my button. I wasn't prepared for it, but now I'm prepared for it. So I just hadn't ever run into that before. Um, but I think Plato portrays Socrates in a way that if you want to think he's arrogant, you, you'll think that. And if you want to think he's really intellectually honest, and so you have to give arguments. You always have to give an argument. You can't worship anybody. He's not going to let you do that. He's going to make you explain your opinions on everything and be very self-critical, very uh, a critical thinker, because that's what we need for a democracy. So does anybody have any comments? Because then we'll get into the process of the class. But any comments or questions? And I'll just call you by name because we have time. Mia, do you have any comments, questions so far? Um, no, ma'am, you've made it very clear. Okay, what about you, Alex? Um, well, I, yeah, I know you've been clear and like, I agree with everything you say that um, it's important to, have, to keep an open mind. And even if we do disagree with something, it, <laughs> we'll keep a, a proper communication so we don't bash each other for no reason. And yeah, we're, the communication is very important. Okay, so does this remind you of when you used to sit up there <laughs> in my classroom? Okay, not this again. But I remember, didn't you sit up in the top row? Yes, ma'am. Slightly to my right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And they had little discussion groups because I used to have like 25, 30 students in a class. So, okay. Um, Melanie, any questions or comments? No, no questions. What about Morgan? No, you've been very concise and clear. Okay, Jack? No, ma'am. Okay, so now we go with the assignments and the process and all that stuff. Um, okay, I thought I had gotten this, but it's all right. I'll get it. Google Classroom. Is everybody on the classroom? Um. Okay. Does, do people know how to run Google Classroom? Have you done Google Classroom before? Most high schools used to use Google Classroom. Okay. Is there anybody here who hasn't used it? I've never used it. Okay, Jack, anybody else? Okay, so if you have any questions, of course you can email me, but, but you can also contact the other students, I suppose. Um, so here's the syllabus. Okay, so I have had one complaint I've had is that you have to take one RPH class. And one of them is Christian theology, New Testament, Old Testament, world religions, world philosophies. So sometimes I have a student that take my class because it doesn't have the word religion in it. I don't want anything to do with religion. <laughs> okay. And then they, then they complain like, hey, this is a bunch of religion. And the thing about it is you really need to know that's not true. Why not? Because Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, and those three were never religions. They were a way of life. And it was colonialism. It was when Westerners came and colonized those countries and made them feel inferior and came in with their superiority complex and intimidated them and marginalized them and oppressed them and exploited them. Part of that was to say, these are religions and we have science, right? And we are progressive. And the only possible religion that goes with progress and superiority is Christianity. So get over it, okay? So that's why 
this is not fair. These are ways of life. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's why we do this. And the other, th and I am a student of Greek philosophy. And so I start out there and I, I have, there's a model of what I call spiritual humanism. And to me, it's the bridge. It's the bridge between raving atheists, agnostics, humanists, atheist humanists, religious humanists, Unitarians, Quakers, secular humanists, and all these others. So I give you a framework through which we look at all these other uh, discipline, um, traditions, and you decide, right? You decide if it's fair or not, and then... Um, you write about it, right? But I give you a chance to see the similarities because all you do is read the paper and you know the differences, that's no problem. Knowing the differences is easy. Trying to find that actually underneath all that are similarities. So that's what I give you that I don't think you're gonna get anywhere else than maybe a college class or maybe a high school class. All right. So I have my office hours, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but it can be by appointment. Those might be very inconvenient times. You don't wanna do it at night, uh, but it just makes it easy, right? So it's the same time every day. That's the only reason that I do that, but I'm on my computer a lot. So it's not a problem to have appointments. Um, we meet from eight to nine, 15, twice a week. Now, when it was AUW it was eight to nine forty, So we can always stay later if you want to, um, but there's so few students that I think we get everything said. Um, then there are these books and I would like you to order them. And I actually can't remember if I put it on the online bookstore, um, but it, it's not a big deal. You can just go and get these books used. They, they are the greatest books. It's so ironic. These are the greatest books ever written in human history. And, and the publishers are begging you to buy it, like a buck and a half. Just take it. <laughs> Why are they so cheap? Has it anybody occurred to you that the books considered the most profound wisdom cost two bucks? Because you can't make any money reading this book, right? So that's why. If you, if you consider how much your books cost, it's probably proportionate to whether learning that is going to make you any money. Um, so you can order them. You must, after the first two weeks, we do the Greeks, and I hope you've bought this book, but if you haven't, I do have attachments because it's online. But after that, I really want you to have the books. Um, if you can't find them for some reason, just let me know. I can send you the order form with the ISBNs. Uh, maybe I'll attach that anyway. Honor code policy, class attendance policy, that's a lion. All these things here are standard in every syllabus, word for word, disabilities, um, harassment issues, um, COVID policies. Um, then I have my own student learning outcomes that you, um, you know, read carefully that um, then the quality of your papers so you just have a thesis statement, you have paragraphing. Again, that's pretty generic, pretty standard. And I have a paper rubric. Uh, then you will present orally. Like every day I ask you, you, we start the day with what are the three points that stuck out for you on the reading. And then every once in a while, after you have your paper due, or there's a couple other assignments where you give formal oral presentations, and I grade those, and I have a rubric for that. And then the content of the papers, 
I look to see if the thesis statement is getting more complex. If you're able to synthesize the material to put it together or to make really important distinctions um, and applications, um, all of those things, if it gets starts getting more complex. And then the, our program is based on the union of reason and faith. And so just about every lecture I give in every class tries to give one model for how to unite some kind of reasoning. It could be biology, chemistry, it can be that kind of reasoning, it can be the kind used in social science, it can be the kind used by Kant in mathematics, it can be um, the kind used by Aristotle or Socrates. It's just there's lots of different kinds of reasoning united with some kind of idea of the good. And it, it might be God, it might be the universe, it might be karma, it might be, you know, you, you name it, um, paganism, right? That idea of the good. And then the mission of Lion would be those five qualities of an educated person, a liberally educated person. Okay. So intercultural knowledge, this is, again, something we're fed in from the, the higher ups. And I'm all on board, no problem. Um, you, you create the, your history, you create your worldview, you create who you are. Integrative learning, the interrelationship between things, becoming reflective and deliberate, making informed decisions, all of those things that were required of all the common core courses, that's perfectly uh, fine in the RPH program. The teaching strategy is to draw out from you. You tell me what you think, you tell each other what you think. I have this additional attendance stuff just because I want to make sure you come because the class is very different according to whether students are there or not, especially in a very small class. Um, okay, so here's the process of the class. Every day, um, at today you need to write an essay, what is my worldview? Um, and you put that on your first post. So every week you have a post, today is only one day, so the first post will come after three, the first three days of class. And you started out with this essay. Then the standard operating procedure, unless I specify otherwise, is before class, you read it and you write three reactions. And this is be part of what you hand in. Um, and then I will call on you what were your three reactions or what was one of them? And then other students can react to that, whatever. Okay, then um, while the other students are talking, you also write down three points that stood out to you about what they said, because I want you to be learning from each other. Because as a group, you are going to be running the world in 20 years. So you need to talk to each other. You need to learn from each other. And then coming away from this, you need to figure out, oh, the students in that particular class had this particular kind of quality about them. Or you might decide lion students in general had this, you know, hopefully more open-minded approach because then you go out in the world and you have to figure out how was it that your conversations and experiences at Lion compare with what you run into um, after you leave Lion. And then your final takeaway, right? So for every day, you have three parts of the post, the three reactions before, the three reactions during the class, and your final takeaway, okay? And you can't say that until the class is over. Then I'll describe the readings for the next class and why I assign it. 
because I have, you know, the class, there's always, is supposed to be connected. I spend a lot of time weaving a class together. Um, and then you post for that, you, you have that day, and then you do the same thing again for the second day of class. And then all together by noon on Friday, no, yeah, by noon on Friday. So the Sunday class, the Tuesday class, by noon on Friday, you post it. And then I'll read them Friday afternoon or Saturday, something. Um, all right. And then you start out with a minimum of 200 words for each day. And then the next week, it'll be 250. And the next week, three. And the next week, 350. And then it, it uh, plateaus there. And that would be a minimum. Okay, and it, and the the Google Classroom tells me how many words, so you can't, you know, you should know. You probably figure that out. Um, anyway, I think as time goes, you'll find more things to say because everything is connected to everything. Then we have a tardy policy, and I do want you to turn on your camera unless there's some reason not to, and so it matters a lot right? It does matter a lot. Then you have some papers due, and those are the due dates. And I have the word count. I have all, I'll put all that on the classroom assignment. Then the final paper is due on at noon on Thursday of final week, 20%. This is the late papers or late posts. And if you're considering majoring or minoring, please keep, um, keep a file with all your papers and maybe your top three posts and just put that in a file. Here's the course time commitment. I try to make it seven hours uh, a week, seven or eight, because that would be a full-time job. And then here's how the points work. Your posts and participation is 50% of the grade. The three papers are 10%, the final is 20. Then the honor code is, this is how I ask you to cite and you can look at all of that. Um, adding, dropping, all of that. Okay, any questions about that, all that stuff? All good. All good? All right. So let me go back here. Um, okay, so now I want, to, wait a sec, I'm looking for an arrow there. All right, then we have the attachment list. This is what you will find. Okay, so then you can see today was introduction day and the attachments were the syllabus. The schedule is was called attachments listed. Then you had the speaking rubric, the paper rubric, and the religion four stages. So all of that was attached. So then for next time, I will have these attachments and for next time, these and all of that. And I think there are about 30 classes. There might be one more than that, or 31, but I'm giving us a little bit of slack, right? Cutting us a little slack um, in case we get behind. So if you wanted to scroll and see, you know, what's coming, you can do that. Okay, then the next one is uh, the paper rubric. This is with three quotes. For the first paper is three short quote quotes. The second one is four, the third one is five, the final is six. And that is specified on the assignment in the Google Classroom. So anyway, so here I'm, I want you to think that it's not the case that each teacher has all these completely eccentric, idiosyncratic like, requirement. You have to jump through their hoops, you know? It, you might feel that way, but at least you can know that I'm trying to give you sort of generic skills 
that you can use in other classes, you can use in your professional life. And so I will say all three of my children were good writers and, and that was important in our family. Of course, they grew up watching their mother read papers in the closet in her bedroom. <laughs> we had this walk-in closet. I put a little desk there and I was always reading student papers. And all my kids became good paper writers. And in their lives, they do a lot of writing and they've got a lot of compliments on their writing. But also it's really critical. First of all, you have to communicate. Second of all, you have to have it as a habit so it doesn't take you that much time. So college is just where it might take you more time to do it, but every time you do it, you should be able to get better next time. Plus, a paper is about forming a thesis statement and giving an argument. And even when you're not writing, if you're just in a conversation with other people, you have to formulate, be able to articulate your conclusion and then to be able to give the argument. So I'm trying to get you into these habits of being able to think clearly, even on your feet. Okay, so my daughter's job, she works on slave labor issues, international slave labor. So she worked at the Department of Labor in Washington and now she works at what's called Rainforest Alliance which is a big um, uh, fossil, you know, sustainability organization. She writes all the time. Then my son is the founder and director of an inner city charter school in um, Minneapolis. He has to write things and they have to be clear because, you know, parents and board members, everything has to be really carefully spelled out because all these people are invested and if it's at all vague, there's going to be misunderstandings. And so that's really critical. And then my youngest daughter is actually a journalist. And so she, she writes a lot. Um, and she writes about economic issues for a newspaper that is funded by uh, foundations and donations. So she gets to write about corporations and the business world without having to worry about the paper not getting advertisements as punishment for bad reporting about the business world. Does everybody understand this? Any kind of news that depends on money, right? Or profit, right? That's why Fox News, Emma, you know, all these things, you shouldn't have your news shouldn't be a for-profit enterprise. And so in Britain, they have, BBC, the British Broadcasting, because it's not motivated or tainted by money. And so my daughter has had those jobs recently. She worked for the Wall Street Journal for seven years, so she knows about reporting that that's tainted. <laughs> um, but anyway, then she got into Marketplace, the National Public Radio, and now she's into a paper in Connecticut. But she is, has a reputation for being a clear writer, and she can get it right the first time. She's done it enough so that she doesn't have to take forever to make it a good piece. So again, when I emphasize this, this is not just to please a professor. And it, I, I don't want that kind of power. I want to empower you, right? It's a tool that can really help you in your personal life and your professional life, that you learn how to articulate what's in your head and to speak it and to write it. So, oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll run through this quickly. So there's a thesis, there's arguments, you know, that your premises are reasonable. There's that your inferences from the arguments are reasonable, that your textual references are not too long, not too short. They support your point. Um, so you have to make sure to cite, even if it's indirect, um, that you give examples, okay? You have an example to support your point, that you are fair to the counter argument. 
so that you state what you think is the best argument against your view, and then you respond to it, that you have good paragraphs. Each paragraph has a topic. So it's sort of an argument within an argument. And then there's grammar. And then there's how complex is your thesis? How creative and how complete is it? And then does it apply? Is it, does it show some event or trend that really is important, right? So it's not trivial. Um, that's important to me because it's terrible the way that people use their minds or go onto social media and they might think obsessively about something, but it's trivial. And like in a democracy, you need to learn to realize what's important and what's trivial if you're going to be a good citizen. So I, I do include that. And then the RPH program is the liberally minded person and the union of reason and faith. So those are the criteria I look for. Then in the speaking rubric, there are just four pretty much common sense, I hope if it's organized, if you deliver it well, if you know your stuff, and if you have a central message, right? You have a thesis. So it's just, you've already written your paper, so it shouldn't be very hard, but just be deliberate about it, you know, when you're speaking. So again, my son, my all my kids, you have board meetings, and it's very important that they are articulate at those meetings. Communication is, you can tell you know this, there's this breakdown in communication in our society and social media aggravates it, I think, although I never go onto social media, I'm sorry. Um, it's just, it's like junk food for your mind and I don't really need that. <laughs> And then here's one way of thinking about what might be on your mind. But I had a student write a paper about why this is a stupid chart. And I was like, it was really good. So, <laughs> so I'm not saying this is the best and it isn't my hidden agenda. I just ran across it and I thought, okay, that might trigger students to just get them thinking like, who am I on this chart? Um, so here, in terms of the worldviews that you were given, are you just a drifter, like you're disinterested and detached? And you will probably recognize some of your peers at Lyon, like they're just detached. They don't really care um, about formulating any sort of reasonable opinion. Just like, forget it. They're interested in something else. Then there might be students that say, this is what I was raised to think. And this is what I think, and I'm not going to question it, right? Then there are the ones that are, okay, I do want to question this, right? And I do want to, in the Greek view, you come in, you have various worldviews, very habits, all sorts of stuff. And then you re-examine it. And if your parents made you eat vegetables, then you go, oh, now I know why they made meat vegetables. And then now you do it for your own reasons. You, now I have internalized it. I've embraced it. This is what I want for my adult life. There's other things your parents might have taught you or the way they lived where you said, no, I don't want that because it's irrational. I mean, there are students I've had, right, who their grandparents are racist, right? And they don't want that. Even though they love their grandparents, they reject it because it's irrational. And so that's what students do in college. They're in the midst of sort of figuring things out. And then the highest phase, which again, I don't buy into this so much because it's as if you found it now and it stuck. It's like, no, <laughs> in some sense, you should always be a seeker. But do you get to the point where you have, you have a path? Like you have within these parameters, that's the direction I want to go. 
And I will constantly expand that. But I mean, there's a basic foundation here, right? Um, so that's another way to just look at the development that you have over time. Um, let's see. So that's what I've got. And then I have posted here um, the assignment on the classwork, right? And you don't have to hand in anything at the moment. You can just um, keep, keep your worldview, what you've typed up in a, a doc. And then after the 18th, a week from today, and you finish it up, you refine it, you polish it, and then you can post it on that classroom, classwork site. All right, so we're just about at the end of the time. Any other questions? Because if a student has a question, some other student probably has that question. So never hesitate to ask a question. Anything that's confusing? All right, so I will, within the next 24 hours or so, post for next week, okay? And what is today? Today is Tuesday. So um, I will see you on Sunday, right, at 8 o'clock. Um, and I hope we get our other two students, but you know you're going to get called on a lot. So <laughs> please be ready, because if you aren't ready, we all depend on each other to be prepared. I hope you understand that, right? Um, and remember, you will, you will be asked to respond to other students. So by the end of this class, you should have had a lot of conversation with every other student. And hopefully, you know quite a bit about them, and they know quite a bit about you. Okay, Not in 14. Bye bye. Thank you. Sure. Are are the